I'm so excited to get this incredible panel out here for you. Firstly, our wonderful moderator, Frank Rich. <laughs> Director Jeff Kaufman. And from the movie and Broadway, Terrence McNally, Tyne Daly, Nathan Lane, Joe Mantello, and F. Murray Abraham. Thank you all for coming. I'm <coughs> delighted to be here to celebrate this lovely movie and tribute to this great playwright. Um, I have a lot of questions, but they can be ignored. I have to note. I have to note. It's the first. This may be the only panel in New York that has two Roy Cones on it. <laughs> <laughs> Both brilliant. I, as I, I, I saw <laughs> Marie Abraham's performance too, and, and uh, way back. Um, anyway, I want to start by um, expressing my. Um, this isn't really a question. Sort of an amazement. The movie is well titled because it's kind of incredible that Terrence survived um, alcoholism, Corpus Christi, Texas, um, lung cancer, Edward Albee, uh, and did, did, wrote these plays that are full of pathos, but also humor, and it's so pr prolific, as you can see in the end credits. And I, I sort of want to start with you, Terrence, and just say, as you look at you know, this, look at this sort of sitting in the audience, what do you feel about your sense of accomplishment? What are you proudest of? Not a particular play or whatever, but about getting through life. What are you? It's, it's a hard question, uh, Frank. Uh, I'm someone who doesn't like hearing his voice on the radio, so you can imagine watching can a imagine. film. Yeah. Uh, I feel mainly how lucky I've been, and my friends and the people I've known loved me and supported me. And I, I think I'm very wealthy in, in great friendships, many of which are on this stage. And I owe so much to them that it would take me forever to tell you just what Murray Abraham or Nathan or Joe, she's a newcomer to my life. <laughs> Ty, and I love her dearly, but. I wouldn't be here without them, and uh, they always love me in, I thought you said you survived, I thought you were gonna start with the New York Times in their review <laughs> <laughs> my first play. Uh, I, I forget who was some the them, but it was some of them actually pretty, pretty, good. pretty deadly. My brother wrote a beautiful, angry letter to them, but unfortunately signed it. Peter McNally, his brother. <laughs> I said, thanks a lot, now I'll get three more bad reviews. <laughs> no, 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 stupid son of a bitch. What, what, <laughs> what, what about, it wasn't something of mine, was it? No, no, it was long before you. You were a very young man and off in Washington. Uh, but I, I think that's it. I couldn't have, I've, I've always felt supported by fellow people who love to make theater. It, it, it's given me joy. I, failed so badly at it sometimes. Sometimes I've felt I succeeded much better than anyone thought. I've run the gamut, but I've loved the work because of the people I've been allowed to do it with. And it is so deeply personal and profound and that um, 
Now, I haven't seen Joe in practically a year, but it's like I just left him, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's family, and I, I do think it's that. I've never felt I had a, a, a job or a career. I had this part of a family I wanted to stay a member of, and uh, uh, I, if that sounds sentimental, I don't care. That's, maybe I'm a sentimental, sentimental Irishman after all. But I do know that what I said in the film is true. One day I just was going up 8th Avenue, and where I was going, it was very cold, and I saw the marquee at the Golden for uh, Mothers and Sons, yeah. and I said, I wrote that. This is, I've had my life. It's a great moment. This is what I wanted to do, and I felt I belong in the theater since, that's only about three or four years ago. Before then, it was never, didn't feel quite a part of it, and Listen, you know what really got me wanting to be in the playwright was when I was really young, I saw On the Town, and there was Frank Sinatra. Yeah. No, no. Oh, the movie. In the movies at the Rich <laughs> Theater right. in Corpus Christi. And I said, that's where I want to live. Three sailors singing and dancing. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good place. And I went, I went directly from my high school graduation <laughs> to the Trailway bus terminal. And I was here 48 hours later. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we're, we're, we're very glad you didn't see Lost to Rise. <laughs> <laughs> Written by Larry Kramer, by the way, the yeah. second version. Um, yes. uh, um, this is a question for everyone, but I think I'll start with Jeff. What did, what did you learn doing the film, and what did the rest of you watching the film about Terrence that you didn't know before? Are there any surprises or unexpected? Yeah. Well, I mean, we knew how great his work is, and we knew the people who had flow, flowed through his work, but it was remarkable how many people would say, just independently, you know, uh, like a blind test. Uh, Oh yeah, he said to me, I'll write a play for you, or I'll write a play for you. It just happened over and over again where he would see someone, he would recognize the talent and the spark in them, and he would want to give that spark a chance to flourish. That was an amazing thing. And then also, I think, um, something from Terrence and from everyone, overcoming the struggle to do work and how hard it is. And Terrence would be the first to say that, you know, <laughs> the genius work isn't something that just emerges out of the marble. There's a lot of carving and that has to go on. And, and uh, I loved seeing that sense of process and that sense of humility that has to come uh, to build greatness. Who else would like to? What, any surprises or just unexpected moments? Well, I mean, what you just think that that's an extraordinary life and 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 career and and maybe it's an incredibly moving story, but and personal. But it was um, the the fact that when you said it was only recently that you felt a part of the theater. Mm -hmm. When I think of you as a cornerstone mm -hmm. of the American theater, certainly the New York theater, but um, I, that was in surprising and, and incredibly moving. I mean, that feeling of that it, it took that long for you to feel that way, and, 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 and it was it's just a, I mean, you know, it's remarkable, it's a remarkable, story of, of where you came from and where you ended up and and um, so I, I you know I think it's it's um, it, you know and it just obviously it also brings back so many memories and, and uh, it was uh, just great to, to see all those people well time um. No, you, well, no, I knew no. I knew that that uh, Terence McNally was one of the only people in my profession and my dad's profession, my family business, that actually likes actors. <laughs> <laughs> Very, but no, actually really loves and appreciates actors. So I knew that part, and I knew that he was prolific, and I knew that he was generous and loving. But I didn't, I'm so grateful for all those pictures because I had no idea how really beautiful you were. Mm. Oh my <laughs> goodness, no wonder. No wonder, baby, with the sparkling thing and the chin and everything. So that, I think the <laughs> that was just yummy to me. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> yeah. 
saying. <laughs> Surpri no, I, uh, uh, it shouldn't have been surprising because he's, you know, like men, he improves. Uh, uh, but yeah, that, that was lovely. Um, stuff I didn't know about Terrence. Well, he's such, he's, he comes at you with so much generosity and open-heartedness that you know a lot about him right away. Um, what I didn't know, I worked on a classic play of his and then a new play that he wrote right. for me uh, or for us because um, he, didn't, he wasn't satisfied with, with reviving a, a version of a play. He had to write a new one for mother, with Mothers and Sons. Um, and he's just, uh, s some people think working with dead playwrights is easier. Uh, because there's no none of those discussions. But with the live playwright, he was there, he was inventive, he was attentive, and he also took, when we couldn't figure it out, he would say, well, this is probably my work, and so you all go to lunch, and when you come back, you know. And he would shape what we were doing. Mm. Um, for the for the its use in the moment, for its use now, not its use twenty years ago or what. For what, what? How does this story mean something right this minute? And to stay that much in the world is extraordinarily courageous, as far as I'm concerned. Um, he doesn't uh, hide away. Hasn't never, as far as I can figure out. Mm. Murray, Joe, any thought, anything that startled you in? This film, or did you feel it was all? I never knew how attractive you were <laughs> until tonight. Plain to see. Plain to see. It's it's. Uh, he's an old friend. It's just a constant reminder, is what it was, that the man just has all this uh, this extraordinary capacity to love. I mean, all the crap he went through, you know, we've all gone through some crap. And uh, not everybody rebounds and bounces back. Mm. And he just hasn't got the capacity to just quit. And I guess that was a nice reminder because he said he's writing three plays. I believe he's writing <laughs> three plays. <laughs> probably wishes he was there now, writing the plays. <laughs> that's all. I, I, that, that, that's a, it's a funny thing to say it's a surprise, because I'm not surprised, but I am. Because you know it's true. It's a nice reminder, considering the trying times we are suffering at right now. <laughs> and uh, I think that says it. It's just this extraordinary well of love that seems to have no bottom. Mm. It's, great to, it's great to be reminded that kind of thing exists. Joe? It wasn't a surprise, but I was struck by the number of people whose story was similar to mine and my, or my, our relationship that said, he took a chance on me. He gave me this. He believed in me at a time where I didn't necessarily believe in myself. You know, I stumbled into directing, but I am a director today because Terrence believed in me. And he said, you can do this. Something that I had no, that I didn't know that I could do. And, you know, and so he, I didn't have a mentor uh, as a director, but I had but he became this beacon of how to have a life in the theater. And that means that you live through the failures. You endure the failures. You feel the moments where you're not in fashion. You learn how to survive success. And you value your collaborators. And uh, at the end of the day, that's what you remember. And that's what I learned from him. And it was, it was just astonishing to see the number of people who had that same experience. When, because you, you, know, you began as a director with, under Terrence's auspices and with him, is there something, one thing that's not in the film I was curious about, I also want to talk about actors and, and Terrence, but, but 
directing, what is he like as a collaborator? Once, you know, once you were, your career was going and you were directing major works of, of his, how would you say the collaboration was with Terrence? I don't, even mean, I don't mean whether it was better or worse, but just how did, it, how did it differ? Was there something particular about working with him as a playwright as opposed to other playwrights? I don't know that it was different. You know, what's, what's kind of astonishing is that he didn't treat me any differently at the beginning of my career when I had absolutely no credits. And years later, when I when I you know had more of a career, he he treated me uh, as a partner, as a collaborator, with great respect. He valued my opinion. He uh, and it was there was a sense of playfulness about him hmm. that it was absolutely deadly serious what we were doing, and yet there was this sense of celebration. And that he never lost that. Mm. He never mm. lost that sense yeah. of celebration That's and right. awe and how fortunate we are that we get to do this. That's a great lesson when you're just starting out. I would think so. What about, you know, I'm thinking of the one theme of your career and also surfaces in the film is that you created these great roles for actors that you loved and, you know, your globe theater, as it were. What happens when? The actor. This may, may we should start this with you, Terrence. When the actor, whom you create the role for, is in some ways ungrateful or feels, oh, I could improve on the role you've created for me. Does that I mean, there must be moments where you're making bargains with each other, a part of the creative process, where it must be. I would think it'd be very strange when you're, you know, doing role for actors of this strength and quality. How? Do, where do you? Where do you? Where do you surrender? Where do you not surrender? How does that work? You mean negotiations? About yeah, negotiations, yeah. That's never really been an issue with, with me. Uh, like I say, I th one thing I must say about the movie, it's 100% honest. There's nothing in it that's false. So there's two points I want to make here. Is when I said to Nathan, I think your part needs something in the third act. And he, I guess, said, I believe him, Maybe something like life is not just like a musical comedy. And I went home and wrote it. Mm. One of the things that moved me enormously in the film today was I think they undersold uh, the shape of the script of lips together, teeth apart, and what was going on in the rehearsal room with people throwing the script down saying, this is terrible. Christine Baranski saying what she did to me. That moved me in the movie t tonight almost more mm. than anything. And thank God I have the ability, I got early on not to feel attacked when people said something isn't work, working. So many playwrights think they're saying, I hate you. I wish you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> they're really saying, this scene could be better. And so I learned so much from Christine and Nathan on that play, working with, with uh, John Tellinger and then Joe when the first draft of uh, uh, Love, Valor, Compassion, he said, do you really want the second act to take place underwater? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I'm trying for something more poetic. And he said, well, maybe a little less poetry <laughs> might be, be helpful. And when people are smart, I've always wanted to work with people I thought were smarter and better than me, because otherwise I'm not going to learn anything. As far as writing for actors, I, I'll try to be really brief. I didn't know I wanted to be a playwright, really, until I was a student in England uh, my junior year of the summer, and I saw an obscure play at the time by Shakespeare called All's Well That Ends Well. And there was this extraordinary actress called Zoe Caldwell. And I said, that's what I want to find, voices, mm. people who can make me understood. Because myself, I feel inarticulate um, when I speak. I'm not so inarticulate when I'm writing. And I said, well, that's what I want to do. I want someone to interpret me. And so Zoe really was kind of, and I always loved voices because my father, uh, among everything else, his favorite singers were Billie Holiday, Edith Piaf, and uh, Ethel Merman. 
<laughs> Those are three <laughs> sounds. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't say, who's that singing? And Maria Collis, let's ask her. <laughs> so, <laughs> what is Lapone? Uh, yeah, I wanted, well, I was too, <laughs> she wasn't born yet, I guess. But so actors' voices have meant a, a, a lot to me, and it is collaboration, but, you know, I, I mean, I really wrote Masterclass for Nathan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think he turned it down, but we did pretty good with Zoe. Uh, and talk about coming full circle in your life from remembering sitting up in the last row of Stratford-on-Avon, and now that woman who so changed your life is doing a play of yours. Mm. Mm. And it turned out well. Uh, so, but the, the, what you were talking about, if you write a play for Nathan or Murray or Tyne, they hear you, so there's, people say, what do you talk about with them? at breaks. I said, where do you want to have lunch? Or did you? <laughs> we don't talk about the meaning of the play because they hear your music. If you have to explain to an actor what a line means, they're not well cast in the part. That's my cranky old man's <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> I mean, you're probably well, right. You know. You and I have never had a fight about a line. Or did Not we? about a line, no. <laughs> <laughs> We've had fights. <laughs> we, you know, look, when I was, you know, when I wound up, the, the Lisbon Traviata, I mean, you know, as an example of, um, you know, they were trying, trying to cast, and it was John Tellinger who said, because they couldn't find the right person for this role, and he was supposed to be an older man, and, and I went in, and, and I, I read it, and I didn't know anything about opera, but I thought, this is a hell of a play, and this, this part is extraordinary. And, and so, and, and we, I went in and read, and they called me, and I said I had it. And, you know, and eventually, after that, uh, which was a, just a gift to a young actor to, have, to get a role like that. It was just a knockout of a part. And then, you know, after we got to know each other, after that experience, he said to me, you know, you came along at a time in my life when uh, I had, he had lost Bobby Drivers and James Coco, and, and he said, I love knowing I can write for someone in, uh, in particular, you know, an, an actor. And, and, and so to have someone of his stature and, and incredible talent say that to me as a young actor was extraordinary, and which is what led to these, these many collaborations. And so I was, you know, it, was an, it, it, it did change my life and career in the theater uh, because mm -hmm. Terrence felt that way. And, and that, you know, that's what's so inspiring about this is that we're going to, you know, <laughs> thanks, what did you say? Thanks for the use of the hall. Um, you know, that we're going to put on a, sh we're going to do this together. We're going to create this together. We're going to figure it out. And, and no one is more excited about it than he is. He has the same um, enthusiasm and excitement about the theater. And, and, you know, it's inspiring. It really is, it's, you know, um, it's been, it's, a, it's very, very moving. And, and, um, and I can't think of a nicer guy who deserved a documentary more than you. <laughs> um, there, there, there are a few things from the film I want to follow up, up on. One is, your brother, he seemed like a terrific guy. What did he do in life? What, did, what was his? Uh, he made the mistake of going to work for my father, <laughs> oh. <laughs> who fired him. And he, he ended up as a guidance counselor in high school for, in a poorer part of town, though. The film made Corpus Christi look really wretched. It's <laughs> uh, uh, and that's what my brother does. and. Uh, it was so interesting that he got my parents, and I thought, oh, so this is my little brother. He was aware of everything, the mm -hmm. antagonism between them and uh, the hard stuff. I, but I was so motivated to get out. You know, I was like that moment in Gypsy, you know, it's like she's ready to go and she steals the, the plaque on the wall. Uh, so right. I, I never felt I was trapped. I was riding my. Uh, exit visa, uh, you know, in about the sixth grade. So, uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I don't um, mean to. Um, slightly different subject. One thing that I was reminded of uh, watching the documentary were uh, 
the early plays, relatively early plays, that dealt with gay characters, gay subjects, pre-AIDS, pre, -AIDS, pre mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the plays that came in the 80s. I was, one thing I wanted, the, Rita Moreno saying that the Ritz in DC, I was going, I had fled DC by then, people hated it, what was it what, like critics hated it, the audiences hated it, and was it homophobia or just usual DC stupidity that I grew up with? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I, I give two long answers. We opened during, Congress was in recess over Christmas, so there's nobody in Washington. Right. And we got terrible reviews, and we thought that the play was hilarious. And Adela Holzer, who was oh, legendary in her day, Ellen, yes. with her thick Spanish accent, she said, you know what's wrong with the play? The set is painted battleship gray, and no one laughs. They're looking at a, a Navy ship for three hours. Paint it red, and it will make a difference. So we said, if you want to pay for the painters to come in on Sunday so we can perform Monday night in the red set, and we painted Sardis red, you thought Neil Simon had been brought in over the weekend <laughs> to do punch-ups. I didn't change a word. The curtain went up. And laugh, laugh, laugh. Adela Holzer was right? Yes, she was. <laughs> and they still put her in prison. <laughs> it's true. She was the original and Max Bialich stuff. And all these years, I can see myself still making that kind of mistake, because I don't know about color psychology. So. So, you know, I'd love uh, to know who the set designer was. He must have. Uh, your next all my sets red. must be red. Yeah. <laughs> so that, uh, I think I may be the only one on this stage, but maybe not, aside from you who actually saw and things that go bump in the night on Broadway. You might be the only one. In my case, Paul Libin got something wrong. He said it was completely sold out during previews, but the reason it sold out was because the tickets were like three dollars and two dollars was that and and I I had a there was a girl I was 15 at the time and there was a girl I was trying to impress from camp from summer camp who wanted to see Hello Dolly said, well I couldn't get tickets to Hello Dolly or I couldn't afford tickets to Hello Dolly so we went and saw things that go by the night I, I never saw her again but <laughs> but it was I didn't you know I but I remember I remember I didn't quite understand the play. I was fascinated by it. I rem remember parts of it vividly. I remember Robert Drivers was in a dress, right? Which was something I'd, I'd you know, n never seen before. It was a little, you know, it was fast, it was, you know, it was really, um, in the play. and I also remember Eileen Heckert getting some boos. I don't think because of her performance, just because the audience was hostile, yeah, hostile. At, at the Royale, and um, she was like, Great, you know, she just loved it. She could have been doing Hello Dolly herself, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would think, but I'm, I'm thinking, you know, a couple of things in the movie that struck me were, first of all, to re be reminded of, of um, Morning, Noon, Night, which I also saw on Broadway, mm -hmm. which I, I, I like so much. I got my college theater to do all three plays, the other two, obviously, by uh, Melfi and uh, Horowitz. Um, but Noon, by the time I saw Noon, I understood it, what it was saying about sexuality. And I remember how shocking, and I know Joe's working on it right now, it was to see Boys in the Band when it mm -hmm. opened the theater four. But in a way, it was later. I mean, it was definitely late. You were out there, as far as I could tell, all alone, particularly having uh, just like uh, this uh, done on Broadway. Yeah. And that, that wasn't on purpose or anything. It's a very simple reason. Uh, clearly, um, after Zoo story, and then Virginia Woolf Edward became so famous. You either were very discreet about it, or, and I just lived with Edward, and and uh, remember, and it's not a bitter story if it sounds that way. Uh, it's what called what you endure, what you go through to be a human being. Uh, it used to be the critics all smoked. You guys all stood out under the marquee, and the only people left standing there were the critics. They flashing the lights. Everyone smoked, everyone put out their I cigarette. Did. Simultaneously made it the big gesture at the foot. And Gene Kerr said to Walter Kerr, let's go see what his boyfriend has come up with. Right. And I thought, I'm not even a playwright to these people. I'm Edward's boy toy. Mm. And I, mm. so I've always been reviewed as a gay playwright. So people said, you were so great about coming out. I was, what you were. I was reviewed as a, as a gay, a homosexual playwright. 
that even hint in a review that Tennessee Williams or Inge or Edward were gay was, oh, instant, getting the hornet's nest going. So I, just the facts of my life and did it. I mean, I didn't make a decision, I'm coming out. I made a decision, I'm gonna live with Edward all because I love him and we're gonna be a couple and if Edward chose not to acknowledge me in interviews, that was his business. Uh, did people in the theater, gay or straight, uh, talk to you about it in, in that period about what an anomaly it was, you know, that, you know, did people, and again, I'm talking about particularly in those early years when it really was so rare, um, did people say, I mean, did you have conversations? Yeah. No, I don't, I can't really. say that was, huh. I've never felt what was wrong with my career was that people perceived me as a gay writer or... Oh, that's not, that's not what I mean. Really. Yeah. What I mean is just your actual actual, colleagues. You're making a... Your, co you know, your actual colleagues in the theater, other playwrights. Well, the, the first two men I lived with did not want to recognize me in Both an interview. In the theater. So enough said. That's was, you know, if you want to do it, it's your suicide, I guess. But I, I thought, uh, you know, I had some predecessors who did pretty well for themselves. And I always had... As I said, th these great friends, I never felt uh, as alone as you're making me sound, you know? I had, well, yeah, I, uh, I'm not just, some. I, I'm standing on the outside looking yeah, in. I know, but I, I never felt, I never felt victimized that way. I really didn't. And, uh, and theater is certainly pretty welcoming of, of gay men and women. It always was, but whether you wanted to be public about it. Uh, but I had, I really didn't have a, what do I do or don't do? I was reviewed as a gay writer. I never gave an interview to the New York Times. I was an unknown person. I had my first play done on Broadway at 24. I didn't, I didn't get the Sunday feature in advance in which I got to tell the world, hey, I'm gay, but I was reviewed as, let's see what his boyfriend has come up with. Mm -hmm. That was just the facts of life. I mean, you know do you that. Remember, do you remember there was a, it was a kind of a spread uh, uh, in, the, in the Times about the presence of homo, um, maybe homosexual writers in, in, in New York. And I think one of the three plays by supposed gay writers was uh, Seascape, was, uh, with, was, was Edward's, uh, Edward's, Edward's Wolf, play. Was... But anyhow, th th there were uh, interviews with different people in the business. What is your take on the possibility? And David Merrick said, uh, there are no homosexuals in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Man was a genius. What can you say? <laughs> One of the great producers of all time. Um, that's because I was when you when you said that, Mary. I was thinking because there's a famous piece which what Terrence saying remind me of by Stanley Kaufman, right. uh, where basically, but it had to be earlier than Seascape. It must have been around. The, but it, was it was before it was before Boys in the Band, so it was like '67. That sounds yeah. right. It yeah. wasn't in the job long where he said he talked about Williams obviously and Albee, but he didn't name them. He didn't name them. Yeah, it was clear to no. people in the business. Inge, Albee, Albee, and Tennessee Albee. Williams, but he didn't name them. It didn't it, exist. Well, well all yeah. I can say is that it, it, you know, it caused sort of a firestorm at the time. I guess I was in high school, but about 20 years later, um, when I was a trauma critic, I wrote a piece for uh, the height of the at the beginning or the height of the AIDS crisis about AIDS and culture. For Esqu I did a piece for Esquire, a long essay. And I brought up the Stanley Kaufman thing because I remembered reading it. From I found it, you know, in the Times Archive. And he wrote a uh, letter to Esquire saying that I completely misinterpreted what he was saying. Mm -hmm. Of course, he, you know, that's how much things had changed, even by 1987. But in, in, in that piece, I remember he was saying he felt that gay writers were sort of not being truthful if they were writing about straight characters. And right, they were, they were disguising. And there's an underlying lie about all their work. Uh, which is right, and basically he was saying they were the, the, the old canard of the women are really men. Exactly. That was you know, that was the level. But the first one I really went kind of public that way uh, after my first play, and I thought I got through the reviews pretty well with disastrous uh, collection of notices. Only one good review. Who was the good Michael review? Smith of the Village Voice? Oh. But someone came up to me and said, "Oh, don't read this month's Swanee review." How many people run out to their neighborhood store? You have Swanee Review. And there was a review uh, called Come Back Albertine by one John Simon, who was oh. making his mark. And he, and he said, 
the love that will not speak its name. I wish it would shut up, and then <laughs> proceeded to rip me apart as a, both a writer and, uh, well, as a gay writer. And that's a review that made me cry. It was six months after the play had closed, and I soldiered on, and uh, that really upset me. It was such a cruel, which he, you know, he loved being cruel. He probably still does. That's a whole other panel, because yeah. <laughs> he was a colleague of mine. Yeah, I know. When I was but, you know, reviewing. a bad review shouldn't make you cry. It can make you wince. But this was personal, I felt. Hmm. But there was, this was something you didn't, polite people did not talk about. And uh, someone like Edward wasn't exactly very helpful when you go on TV and be coy about being married. He was a very good looking guy, as you could see. And I'm sure a lot of women would say, oh, Mr. Albee. I'm over here. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like the agent Sue Mengers in the 60s that say, used to follow Steve Sondheim around and say, Sue Sondheim doesn't have a great ring to it. <laughs> um, on, an, on, an, on another subject, um, you create these iconic roles for actors like the ones on, on the stage, and then they're played by other actors. You know, and I think uh, all great actors, for instance, Tyne doing Master Class, the, the different casts who have done, uh, the major casts have done Frankie and Johnny, and others, and how, if they were created for, how does that all work in these productions? I'm not talking about stock productions, you know, first class productions in, in New York where you've been involved. What's that like as an experience for you? What's it like maybe for a director doing one of them? What's it like for actors who either, as in your case, taking over a legendary role or perhaps the case of uh, Nathan and Murray seeing other people do them, mm -hmm. these things that were created, you know, almost bespoke for you. Sometimes there's new insights to a part that none of us thought of in the rehearsal room. Very often I wince and uh, dissemble afterwards. Because um, one thing about regional theater, no matter where you see the play, they say, we know it's not maybe Broadway standard sets, but in our own way, we think Janie brings a pathos and a <laughs> you know, an that, honesty that neither Zoe nor Time <laughs> managed to capture. And you go, yes, she did. That she did. <laughs> so you don't have to say much to these theaters because they're very self-congratulatory. <laughs> you know, you'll see a production. So one production of uh, Love Valor, and I said, you know, we she was very proud. You know, we're just doing this play on a bare stage. It was just a suggestion of a little house. Well, guess what Joe Mantello's set design was? A bare stage. <laughs> but they think they invented it, and uh, you just go, thank you, I'm glad you're doing the play. But every so often, I remember one, and I could say this in front of time, I saw a master class in Paris with Fanny Ardant, and it was directed by... Roman Polanski. Roman Polanski. <laughs> And she did two things in it that I thought were extraordinary. When you entered the theater, she was going through the scores, or he did it, and occasionally someone would start to clap her, and she'd just look at them, and when the play proper began, they wanted to clap, and she said, we're here to work, and went back to doing the scripts. So that's pretty smart. And then when she did the monologues of Onassis, she made him the handsomest, sexiest man, where every other Maria has made him a monster, which I think he was, and is what I wrote. So it was over, I said, you are terrific, but you've turned Onassis into Cary Grant and Robert Redford and you know every handsome, seductive man who ever lived. He said, well, I was in love with him. Of course he was handsome huh. and seductive. And I thought, huh. that's an intelligent actress thinking of, of an it's interpretation. It's a French actress, honey. <laughs> 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 but I thought I learned something. <laughs> But when we did the play with Tyne, I didn't say, Tyne, you know what might be an interesting thing? I, I, no, I've never want to see the Broadway production recreated, uh, you know, which it very often is when you see other. And, but The uh, stuff is so good. The stuff is so good. When you were talking before about having arguments about stuff, when you get a play that has 
insight and language and punctuation in it that is so co wonderful, like a great a composer of anything. You, and you observe the notes, and you observe the pauses. It's, it's I hate this phrase, actor proof, but it's, it, 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 it allows itself to give a lot of actors a chance to try it. So the idea that people are out there trying Mothers and Sons, which I love. We played here for a while and Broadway's okay, medium kind of hit and stuff like that. But the play's out there and all mm. sorts of people are doing it. And Master Class is out there. And Lips Together, Teeth Apart is out there. And these, this amazing body of work, nobody gets to own it except for him. Us don't own it. Us just try and uh, uh, tell it again. But anybody gets to try because it's, a story worth telling, stories worth telling. Mm -hmm. That's just, you're a fool if you can't see that. You can see that when you open the French version. Mm. This is good storytelling. Mm. So it belongs, um, what am yes, I, 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 I off yeah. topic, sorry. Uh, but particularly, re particularly belongs to regional theaters. But huh? no, I'm joking, I was just joking. No, no, I, no I yeah, no, I, no I, I, it, it still must be a strange sensation for a play that's so contemporary and that was just done by you or you or you or you to see it done so fast, and but I guess that's just. He reported to me there was a really good woman in Florida who was doing Mothers and Sons, mm -hmm. far too close to when we'd finished the play. It was a little painful. <laughs> um, no, but I don't know. Uh, I've had the luck to do some really big plays that were owned by other actresses before. I and, dare say. And yeah. when your playwright is around and gives you permission to go ahead, you own it this time, you take it. Yeah. That is very freeing. Uh, makes you feel confident. You know? I, Zoe Caldwell and, and, and uh, Audra knocked me out when I saw that play in New York. Couldn't move from my chair. Went back and wept all over you know, Zoe. And so when he called me and said, play it, I said, are you kidding? I can't do that. It, it belongs to that. He said, you're wrong. Now, it's, now it belongs to you. You want to come play for me? And I was <laughs> delighted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, we're nearing the end. My last question, I think, is for you, Terrence, <laughs> and what's happening there, declaring They're war outside. Um, can you say anything about the plays you're working on? The plays I'm working on? Um, not, no, I'm, I, um, uh, one is called, I can, I'll tell you the titles, that's about it. I can remember them. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, what is Prunes. I love that title. <laughs> I love the title Prunes. And the second one is called Rub a Dub Dub. Oh. And the third play doesn't have a title. Um, and there's parts for all of these people. <laughs> and then, but you know, the, well, that's, the, that's the, good news. The, one other thing I, I just oh. want to say that. Oh, to be in rubber dub dub. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. The hard. Here's hoping. <laughs> as both Nathan and my friend Don Roos, who someone out there pointed out, if I do have a failing, a character flaw, it's I get possessive of these actors. You said, yeah. So when Joe turns a play down, or Murray is busy, or Nathan is busy, or Tyne is not interested. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit, I made you, and I can break you. <laughs> Just a little bit. I'm glad this finally came out. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. A wonderful movie. I appreciate it.